A very good evening and a heartfelt welcome this evening to our Wednesday night live service here on the online church on Facebook. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Stanley. I'm a minister and preacher here in South Africa for the past 14 years. We've been, oh, 10 years since 2014, we've been ministering here on Facebook um, full time and also on YouTube as well. Uh, we are a, a full-fledged church that are a church without borders. We minister across the globe, across the country, to every single house and home that you can think of. Everyone that has technology, that has a cell phone, that has Facebook, YouTube or Telegram can tune in. And we are so privileged for this opportunity that the Lord is granting us to minister the Word of God across the world. Hallelujah! Isn't that a privilege? We can reach far more people through this method than um, just knocking on doors and walking from home to home as I did in the initial stages of my repentance after I've been born again. There were no technology like this. Cell phones did not even exist. So we had to go knock on doors, walk the streets. And so we minister the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this way, it's way more effective. We don't see the privilege often uh, in, uh, by this method that we have, but we have a great, great uh, um, privilege from the Lord that He has granted us to share the gospel in this way as far and wide as possible. Now, good evening. You are tuned in. If you are just tuned in, we are just giving everybody the opportunity to tune in live Wednesday night, Facebook, the online church, the online Kerk Afrikaans. It's the online Kerk. It's an acronym for the online church. D-A-K. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Welcome to all our lovely brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are tuned in frequently and not so frequently for the first time, I want to welcome you and please do contact us. Hallelujah. Uh, in this way as well. Please do contact us. There's already a few people that has contacted us uh, since we, uh, um, since our services of last week, we've a little bit shuffled and changed our services. And I just want to mention it to you. There are so many people that already has contacted us, ask for praise, whatever the case might be. So um, yes, it's also very effective to minister the gospel in this way as well and also thank you for those who have already contributed to our uh, we've asked if you can contribute 200 rand for the boosting that is to advertise our services far and beyond our traditional method face we we place an ad in facebook forces and and and, uh, and spreads it across the entire facebook and this is how a lot of people came across the ministry so i want to thank you you have contributed to the lost and also to souls that can be saved in this way. Yes, and afterwards we do upload our video to our YouTube channel with exactly the same name. Telegram group, video and audio, and our WhatsApp group, the audio. Only the audio there as well. Goeienavond, I just want to speak Afrikaans a little bit. Baie dankie vir amal wat al bygedra het tot die um, boost van ons, van ons uh, um, dienste, dit is om te adverteer en dan forceer Facebook dit baie verder as ons traditionele maniere en so het mens al op die bediening afgekom so het, so het mens ons al gekontak ook en ons kan al met hulle gesels het en ja, ons prijs die Heere van die leerskare daarvoor so jou, <coughs> het wat jy bijgedra het en natuurlijk gaan ons aangaan, ons gaan net ons hoofdienst um, op hierdie stadium, gaan ons wel so deersteer en adverteer, so dat het wel op baie meer platforms kan uitkom en meer, baie meer mense kan bereik. And just for the sake of interest, uh, just for an interesting sake, <laughs> um, according to our Facebook insights and statistics, uh, more than 70% of viewers, across the board are women. Uh, 23 to 21% are men 
and then obviously there's a lot of people that don't specify on their Facebook what gender they are, but this we can more or less see uh, what group of people do we reach, and the women is basically from all ages that we do reach, yes, so just for the sake of all our men out there, please share the gospel that more men can become born again and start following and listening to the gospel. And this is the thing we as uh, men, we um, uh, must uh, sort out our life. We must stand up for the truth. We cannot wait for our uh, spouse, for my wife, to set the space, uh, to set the pace spiritually. I must stand up. I must understand. I cannot wait for my wife. I cannot feed from my wife. My wife must feed from me. My children from uh, must feed from me as a husband. God has set the family in order in that way, and we try to change it. Although if your wife are, is, uh, is busy serving the Lord, she will go to heaven. She will be saved. But uh, by waiting for your wife, you are also hindering as a man the work of the Lord. You are also uh, 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 stopping the progress of God's word. Then we cannot uh, uh, um, accuse our wives if they get into strange doctrine and strange religion because we as husbands are not at a point where we must be. So I want to encourage you as a man, as a husband that are tuned in tonight, stand up, make sure, talk with me so that we can, uh, so that we can start uh, uh, walking a spiritual road together, that you can understand something and break free and break loose so that you can give guidance to your wife and your children, not the other way around. Your wife must teach your children from your mouth, from what you uh, um, understand, how you understand the gospel. And if you are lukewarm and not serving the Lord as you should be as a husband, then there are this, this, uh, then there are, then there's troubles in your physical home as well. So I want to encourage you, please, men. More than seventy percent, up till seventy-six percent at times, are women listening to our services. At the most, twenty-three percent men are listening to our services, and this is a general notion in the Christian world at large. So it's not just. Our, our, our ministry, it's the ministry, the gospel. If you, uh, even when I came to the Lord, the majority of people in the congregation were always women. And men are waiting for women. But the problem is, if you leave your wife outside, uh, you leave her to the wolves. You leave her to the serpent to come and deceive her while you are not at a place. Then you cannot point finger to your wife and say, why have you misled us? And what is this strange doctrines that you are busy with? You as a husband must stand up. Make sure you are serving the Lord in spirit and truth, not in the lustful greediness, sinful desires of this world. Stand up and be a man for your wife and a, and a um, father for your kids as well. Baba gaan letterlijk mal omdat sy vrou pas sê. Hallo Devane, waar is Devane? Hallo Baba, praise the Lord. Baba, it's my, oh, I almost want to say small child, it's my grandchild. And yeah, uh, we look after during the day. Uh, but tomorrow we are off. We're not going to see her tomorrow. We have got somebody that we must meet tomorrow here in our home. Please pray for us that this meeting will be successful and that the Lord can also speak in this lady's life. Hallelujah. So please pray for us. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, if the Lord's willing is, will is there, then we're going to minister someone in our home. Yeah, in Langebaan. If you don't know where I stay, I'm in Langebaan. And uh, pray for us, if the Lord willing, um, next year we can do road trips again. We can go and visit everyone in South Africa. Uh, we have an upcoming, I don't want to, uh, spill the beans right now, but if the Lord willing, we might have a, just a little outreach uh, coming up uh, in the next week or three. So please pray for us as well, that the Lord's will might be there as well. Hallelujah. 
Nou ja, goeie naand, goeie naand en alles Afrikaanse vriende, ek praat van ons een bykie Engels, om nie ons Engels achter weer te laat nie. So praise the Lord and my wife and myself, we have spoken and we have decided thus far that Friday mornings we will be together again. Then I'll be sitting this side and she'll be sitting this side. <laughs> yes, amen. So then we will be ministering as the Lord leads. Yeah, Afrikaans, English or just Afrikaans, doesn't matter. We're going to see how the Lord leads there as well. But before we're going to continue, I'm going to minister about count it all joy that we can read in James. But before we're going to get there, I just want to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we can be gathered together tonight as believers, non-believers, everybody that I tune in tonight, Father, are most, are most welcome. If I think of your life, Jesus, when you were on earth, you invited everybody, you were everywhere, ministering the gospel to everyone, not giving heed and, and not to be seduced by sin and the desires and lustful greed of this world. You just carried on with the work the Father gave you in holiness, in purity, in love, in sincerity. And Father, this is our desire. Uh, uh, while we have the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, who showed us the way and showed us who you are, you are full of love and compassion and goodness, long-suffering, meekness. Father, humble. You are humble. Jesus Christ, you are humble. And we must learn from you. And this evening, I pray, Father, please guide me while I've prepared this sermon, that you will guide us and that you will lead me, that I will not choke this evening. Uh, it feels quite strange to minister English alone, but please help me, Father, that I can carry across the message that you gave to me in my heart. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What yippie is now here though? Alleen een vrouw ook, waar is Tanni Karen? Tanni Karen is so 5 tree van my af. Dis wat Tanni Karen is. <laughs> Daar lag sy, ek hoor al lag. <laughs> die wat by ons huis was, jylle weet, is, sy sit nie kom bys, ek is hier so. So prijs die heren, jylle weet nou was Tanni Karen. A waar nie weet was Tanni Karen, sy kan vir jou vertel alleen. <laughs> now, this evening I want to talk about Count It All Joy, that's a scripture in James. Now, in our last Afrikaans meeting, uh, I talked about the testing of our faith. Now, my wife also talked about it in her Tuesday morning program. She elaborated and confirmed certain things and just refreshed our minds uh, regarding what is the purpose and how our faith gets tested. Now, tonight I want to do a quick recap and continue with this topic. So, it's going to be intertwined, a recap and continue uh, with this specific topic. Now, I just want to mention at this stage that the gospel is, is actually very, very simple. But because the intention of man's heart is evil, he argues against a lot of things. And this is where the gospel gets complicated. Not that the gospel is complicated, but each one complicates the gospel for themselves. Now, we have read that God said to Noah that the intent of the thoughts of man's heart is always evil. That's why we need to guard our heart. We make, want to, must make sure that God is in your heart, that the word of God is also in your heart. Now, the, pers is the, the purpose of this message is to clarify certain things in a born-again Christian's life so that we can live an un uncomplicated spiritual life. We don't, we, sometimes we just complicate it. We just complicate things for ourselves. Now, I just want to continue and I want to uh, reiterate James 1. Let's read James 1. We're going to read two verses there. James 1, I'm going to pick up our conversation uh, here in James 1, verses 2 and 3. Um, James 1 verses 2 and 3. Jacobus 1 vers 2 and 3 if you don't know as Afrikaans person who is James. Most of the names in the Bible are quite obvious if you speak Afrikaans and English but some of them, them are a little bit tricky like James and Jacobus sometimes it doesn't seem to seem to be agreeable with each other but that is it. 
Dit is waarheid, moeilijkheid wanneer een mens tegen die evangelie strijd. That is right, we complicate the gospel in our own lives. Now, let us read. My brethren, so yeah, he's talking to Christians, born again believers, not the sinner. Once again, we can see all the letters that were written in the New Testament were written to specific churches, to specific believers. Okay, so the Bible is basically for you as a believer. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So this trials is the testing of your faith and that produces patience. Now verse, when we read verse 12 to 15, we see that this temptation is, is, is described as a testing method. So even temptations can be a testing of our faith. Now while on this subject, while James were writing here, while he was on this subject, he clarifies something in verse 13, that God does not test us with sin. He never tests us with sin. He wants to clarify this point, because there is idea, there are people that think that God places certain sin in our life to see whether we're going to sin or not. But here it is clear, if you're going to read verse 13, it's not God that makes us to sin. Now, the reason why we sin is clarified in this part of Scripture. So if you're going to read through it, you will see how, why do we sin? It's not God that makes us to sin. It's not God that places sin in our lives, that temptation of sin to test us. Now, let's clarify the point before I'm going to continue. Let's clarify the point where it says uh, um, we must count it all joy when we fall in various trials. Now, we're going to come back to count it all joy. But these two verses describe trials in general, not just sin. And I know with my Afrikaans sermon, we placed emphasis on the temptation of sin. But when we read here in verse 2 and 3, it is trials in a general sense. And then from there on, he focuses on the fact that sin is also a temptation. That is also a trial in our life. Now, fall in this uh, context doesn't mean we must fall into sin. But th that is sin that surrounds us every day in the world we live in. So that fall doesn't mean you are forced to fall in sin. It means it is sin that surrounds us every single day. And because it, it talks about trials in a general sense, it is all about things that surround us and test our faith, not just sin. So everything in our lives it surrounds us there. The daily woes and trials and things and pressure that is on us are there every single day. And this is what he says. Uh, um, we fall in various trials. So there's various, there's different things that test our faith every single day. Dankie my vrou, ja omring is die rechte woord wat jy daar gebruik het. So, ons word elke dag omring dier dinge. Dis wat hy sê, ons val in verskye versoekings. Dis nie jy moet daarin val nie, dit is dinge wat die mens omring. And then, when uh, we must make a decision whether to partake in the sin or not the sin. Now, when we read in Hebrews 12 verse 1, it also um, confirms what we have just read in James. That is now in Hebrews 12 verse 1. And let us just read there as well. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now that ensnares literally uh, means that is all around us. And let us run uh, with endurance the race that is set before us. So sin surrounds us every day. We are in this sinful world. And that is what it means that uh, uh, the sin that 
uh, uh, we we fall into every day. So it's not we must fall in sin. It's things that surrounds us. And because he's talking about temptation, in a general sense, it's all kinds of circumstances that test our faith. Okay. Now, what we basically talked about in our last fellowship was the fact that Christians and sometimes non-Christians have the idea that the devil are waiting specially for them to make them to sin and do wrong things. Even the world thinks this. Now, the devil, I've got the the devil this side, I've got an angel this side, and now I, today this devil got an upper hand, and this devil made me to sin. Even in the world, there are depictions of that as well. Now, um, it is as if the devil are just waiting every day just to target you alone. Okay. Now, first of all, we need to take the following note. This obviously excludes the fact that sometimes we make trouble for ourselves and things needed to get sorted out. So sometimes we make troubles and that stuff needs to get sorted out. So this doesn't fall into this category. It's things that we must face and sort out because sometimes we don't want to face the consequences and the, and the decisions that we made that, uh, that brought trouble in our life. Even as a child of God, you live with consequences. Sometimes long after your spiritual rebirth, there are consequences. And let me just testify in my personal life. <clears throat> I was 17 and I forced my mother to uh, sign for me to buy my first car. At that time I still worked with Telcom. It was a government institution. Post and te telecommunications. So I bought my car. I could have afford it. And my, at first my, my, my mother refused to sign for me because I was under the age of 18. So she had to sign for me. And eventually she signed for me and I was still a sinner at that point. And one night with my sinful ways and in my drunkard state, I skipped a robot in Hilbra, made a huge motor crash and obviously I was locked up and I was tested and, and so forth and so forth. So they found alcohol in my blood. Eventually I didn't, I didn't go to, to jail, but I was trialed and I was just giving, given a stern warning because it was my first uh, um, incident. Then a while after that, and obviously because there was alcohol in my blood, the insurance refused to pay the um, rest of my car, the payments of my car. So I had to go and pay it every single month while I didn't have a car. Then I came to the Lord and that was still there every month. When I came to the Lord, all that debt wasn't scrapped. I had to continue paying because I paid for my sin. And then eventually, uh, I still, I think I had one more year left to pay. I met somebody at West Bank and this and that. And the next moment, one year's payment was scrapped at that moment in time. But I had to pay four years. I, I did not even had a car for one year when I scrapped it. So for almost four years, I had to pay that. And it was almost two years after my repentance, I still had to pay that payment. So sometimes we think when we come to the Lord, the world will, uh, will, 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 will find us uh, guiltless and they will and everything will just change automatically. That doesn't always happen. Happen. There's certain things that immediately change, but there's certain things that will take time and we will pay the penalty for some decisions that we made. Okay. Now, with this kind of thinking, Christians usually say, uh, uh, usually would say that the devil causes them to sin and causes them to fall away from their faith. And this makes the devil happy or it steals their blessings. Now, most of the time when we talk about blessings, it's financial stuff uh, or hinders their calling. So this is the things we talked about. Um, if we think the devil is every day there just for us, we think he is robbing us of blessings and he is happy when I fall into sin and God is disappointed, which is not the case. God knows our heart and he knows what, what is still in our heart. So we cannot disappoint God at any point of time in our life. It's impossible to disappoint God. You might be disappointed in yourself, but you never can disappoint God. Okay. Now, as we get to James 1 verses 14 to 15, it shows us that, uh, that it is our own desires 
that attracts us into sin. That is all around us. So the sin, we are in the sinful world. Now when we read in verse 14 and 15 from James 1, we see it's our own desires that lures us away, that traps us, that attracts us to the sin. The sin that is in our heart. So if you don't have a problem with certain sin in your heart, you won't fall into certain sin. Okay, good. So I think we can understand it up till this point. In other words, the devil isn't placing sin specially on your path, everybody. But sin is all around us because the world is in the power of the devil, Satan, and Satan is the god of this world. This you can read in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 4. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 4 tells us Satan is the god of this world. And then 1 John 5, 19, 1 John 5, 19 tells us that our whole world is in the power of the devil. But we, while we are in this world, we must make the right decision. It's up to us which decision we're going to make. Now, we must deliberately decide not to sin. But while the sin is still in our heart, we will keep on falling for a certain sin, a certain uh, uh, certain problems that arises every day and it's not the devil waiting for you God testing you it's your own heart the, 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 the lack in your own heart that makes you fall under certain circumstances under certain things every single time now on the other hand we have also talked about how the word of God is a tester and a refiner of your faith like silver and gold get purified now fire is the testing ground for impurities to be separated from silver. We know if they uh, uh, dig out gold and silver, they place it through immense fire and that fire separates the impurities from the silver or the gold. So the fire reveals that impurities and it's also called it is tested by fire. Now, as, a, as born again children of God, we have the living word in our hearts that constantly reminds us not to sin and follow after the lust and the greed of this world. So if you are born again, you have the living word through God's Holy Spirit in your heart. And that living word is the words that came from God through Jesus Christ in your heart. And the Holy Spirit only testifies of the word of God. So if a temptation presents himself, the Holy Spirit reminds you um, of the word that is in your heart. And that word tells you that that sinful thing you are about to do or ponder about is wrong. And then you have to make that decision whether I'm going to act upon the word and do what the word says or am, am I going to do what my sinful nature and greed and lust in my heart tells me to do. So that is a decision that we have to make every single day. Now, two of the aspects of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is self-control and long-suffering. Now, when we exercise self-control and long-suffering, we act in obedience to the Word, because it's written in the Word. Everything that we read in Word is written in the Word. Now, it's written in the Word that the fruit of God's Spirit that are in you as a born-again believer is self-control and long-suffering. Now, if you practice self-control, if you practice long-suffering, what happens? You act upon the Word. You decide to follow the Word. Then the Word starts with a refining process because the Word of God is like fire in your heart to reveal th certain things in your life. And if you act upon the Word, then what happens when you face certain, a certain sin in your life? What does self-control and long-suffering uh, long does? It makes you think twice or three times or four times. So it makes you to stop before you act. And the moment when you can do that, you exercise self-control and long-suffering in the same sense because you don't act immediately of, or, or impulsively on what you experience or what you see. And as you are practicing that, eventually the Word of God will purify you from the wrong, the, 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 the impurities of sin that are laid, that got hold of your heart, that, which is in your soul. So I think up to this point, it's a, it's a good recap of what we 
uh, uh, talked about in our free, a previous sermon, but I think there's one or two things that are also uh, a little bit more clearer in this way as well. Now, what happens if we do sin? If you do sin, what happens now? Now the Holy Spirit will convict you. You will feel bad about it. And most of the time you will be reminded of something that is in the word that what you did is wrong. It's not right. Okay. Now, the, now even in that moment, you have a decision. What are you going to do after you have sinned? Because the instructions of God's word, and we must understand God's word is his will. Okay. So his word is written for us to understand what his will is. So if you do what is instructed in the written Bible, you do what the will of the Father is. Now the Bible says, if you have sinned, you must confess. So you must act upon the word. And the moment when you confess, you act upon the word, and then the word, because you confess and you ask the Father for forgiveness, through the word of God, your soul gets purified and you are pure once again. Because the Holy Spirit confirms the word, you must confess. And now it's like this fire burning in you, driving you and making you feel guilty so that you can go and confess your sin before the Father through Jesus Christ, which is the Word of God. Then only you can be purified. So in that in that respect, you are also you also get purified by the Word of God the moment when you start acting upon something that a Bible says. And in this case, confession of sin. It, uh, ignoring sin doesn't cleanse you from sin. Confessing this is the biblical. Uh, a will of God that purifies you. Now, this is one aspect of your spiritual life and continuing testing. Now, I think we can uh, we can try to understand. We can understand why we must be joyful in this as well. Not joyful for the temptation, but while the temptation is there, we can be joyful because what happens now? Your sin gets revealed. The wrong in your life gets revealed. And we must be glad and happy that God's Spirit, through the Word of God, reveals the wrong in your life so that we can, can confess it and rather act upon the Word of God so that the Word of God can set us free from sin. And the moment when the burden of sin is gone, we delight in the Word of God. We delight in the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the, then the burden isn't hard and, and 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 it's not weighty to serve the god uh, to serve the lord and this is what jesus christ said take up my burden take up my yoke it's a sinless yoke it's a sinless burden that's what it means so we must be glad that we can fall into that temptation so that our hearts can be revealed through the fire of God's word and God want to set us free and that's why we can be joyful hallelujah thank you father you have revealed this thing in my life I'm going to confess it and I know from now on I must act contrary to my sinful desire and nature and lust in my life and rather act upon the word of God because the word of God is life sin is dead and while we continue in willful sin we will feel death in our hearts we will feel uh, we will feel heavy we will feel burdensome it will feel that the gospel is hard and heavy no it's not the gospel it's sin weighing you down and this temptations this trials wants to remove that sin from you so that you can serve the lord in spiritual freedom hallelujah isn't that amazing hallelujah praise the lord hallelujah now it says it talks about various types of trials and uh, uh, testings. Now let us read just a confirmation of this in 1 uh, uh, Peter 1 verse 6 to 9 because now I'm going to talk to you about a different kind of testing than what we have discussed thus far. Because thus far we have discussed when we come into this 
when we are in this world, sin surrounds us. That's a tempting, a temptation. That's a trial for us. The word are there, the fire of God's word. When we are born again, we are, uh, uh, we are in the middle, if I can put it like that. And we must make a willful decision. And that is a trial and a testing. And the, God, and the word of God says, God does not test us through sin. It's our own desires that lures us after certain sin in our lives. But we must make a decision rather to obey the will of God. And this is one method. Now let's continue to the next one. Let us read 1 Peter 1 verses 6 to 9. 1 Peter 1 verses 6 up till verse 9. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 till 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if needed be, you have been grieved by various trials. Hallelujah! Dear alle rande versoekings. Ek wil net gaan hier die Afrikaanse woord kry, een kort tykje onder alle rande beproevings. Under various trials. Hallelujah! That the genuineness of your faith. This is now the, the what this is one purpose why the trials comes our way is to test the genuineness of your faith as genuine as you confess with your mouth. Okay, being much more precious than gold and silver. Hallelujah, gold and silver gets tested by fire. And if your faith is even more precious than gold and silver. Then the fire, and that's why what uh, uh, um, John the Baptist said, Jesus Christ will come and baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That fire is a fire of purification while we are on this earth. The hell fire is not the fire of purification. It's a fire of damnation. So there's no purification after death because the Bible says that man is destined to die once after that the judgment. So they are no, and that fire after death is the fire of judgment, not the fire of purification and cleansing, as is the popular doctrine in the Christian world. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, so you will only find praise and honor and glory at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now my wife, in her, in her uh, program Tuesday, she said, and, um, and I'm going to talk out of her mouth, if you are in a certain work situation, the worker that always seeks uh, praise from his boss makes our... Uh, burden in the company because if his boss doesn't praise him he wants to leave the work he wants to he is always his mouth is full of the boss and the boss is always wrong and he always thinks that there is something wrong that a boss that he boss is altijd onrechtvaardig that a boss that a boss that a boss, <laughs> that a boss doesn't uh, want him there whatever the case might be find fault with him all the time but the person that are there that does his work that what he, that, that must be done and he does it with his whole heart he is profit for that business he doesn't seek praise from his boss now in the gospel is the same we seek praise from the lord and everyone around us on a daily basis while we are here on earth if we seek praise on earth, we're never going to get it. And then is the, that is then that the gospel becomes burdensome. That is then that the gospel is uh, hard for us. So, wanneer ons die heel tyd aanvaarding en komplimente soek, terwijl ons op aarde is, in die evangelie, dan raak die evangelie vir ons moeilik. In a rock heart. But if we know what is our responsibility, and this is what the Bible says, we must make our calling sure. We must be sure, unfair. Thank you, Lindy. We always think the boss is unfair towards us if we are seeking praise from the boss. And even if you are a diligent worker, and if there is an unfair situation, you just carry on. And uh, after a while, you take on the personality of that business. Now, so we, so we must take on the personality of Jesus Christ that says we are unprofitable servants. Jesus Christ died 
and he never got the praise that we think that he must have got while he was on earth. Because he knew when he died on the cross, that will be his reward as souls going to come into his kingdom. Hallelujah. Now whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, you yet believing, you rejoice with inexplicable, inex inexpressible and full of with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, so here we see if we know what is our responsibility and we lay hold of the hope that this way I say if we if we know that the primary purpose of our life of our faith on earth is one day the salvation of the souls and you lay hold of that calling, then you are full of joy, inexpressible and full of glory. And this is while you are busy going through all the trials on earth because while you are going through this trial, your faith, which is much more precious than gold and silver, are tested by fire. And one day you will get your reward, not while you are here on earth. Wow, isn't that amazing? Something to look forward to. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I cannot see everybody's comments here. So please bear with me. If I don't see your comment, I cannot see all the comments here while I'm busy ministering. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, now let's continue. Now the other aspect of testing is persecution for the sake of the gospel. Now this is directly aimed at you. Persecution for the sake of the gospel is directly aimed at you as a believer. Okay, now even in this we must be honest with ourselves. Are we really persecuted for a gospel? Or is it because of our own attitude and character flaws and sinful ways? Now we read in 1 Peter 4 verses 15. 1 Peter 4, 4 verses 15. Just let, let, let us read that one verse. 1 Peter 4 verses 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. So if we get persecuted because of some sinful things that we do it's not for the sake of the gospel so we must just be not confuse this and we must be honest with ourselves and sometimes we feel very sorry for ourselves when we get persecuted but is it always for the sake of the gospel okay now the problem that sometimes arises when we think that we are persecuted for our faith is because we willfully live a double standard life by refusing to change our habits and old nature or old, old char character. So this is, this is a thing we must sort out. Sometimes we are so deliberate. I will do this. I grew up like this. This is my insight. This is how I do things. And we refuse to let it go. And on the other hand, we want to minister the gospel. And people around us see this double standard of living in us. And sometimes we think people don't see what we are busy with. Now, what kind of a testimony would we have if we live a double standard of life? In the world at large, sometimes the world are happier than the born again believers. So why should the world change to become a depressed and and, 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 and double-faced and two-faced like we are? No. They see sometimes right through us. And in that trials and in that testing, we must also sometimes, if we do get that persecution, you must also go back and say to yourself, why have I been persecuted? Is it only because of the gospel's sake or what other reason as well? So we must sort that out in our hearts as well. Now, if, for instance, you are really persecuted for the gospel's sake, that is a, a direct attack against you as a believer. So that's a direct attack 
against you. And that's also part of the fiery trials, the various trials, because your faith is more, more precious than gold or silver. And one day you want to enter into God's kingdom. So our faith while we are on earth must be purified all the time. So it's your faith life. And this is also a testing method. This is where people who are under the sway of the devil, that is under the control of the devil, will persecute you when you minister the gospel to them. And I think we all were there at the stage of our life and are maybe there in a constant, uh, uh, um, a constant situation where we do get persecuted just for the sake of the gospel. doesn't matter how you try to live, how you try to change your habits, you do get persecuted. But even in that, if you can accept it, it also changes a character in you to be more like Jesus Christ. Now, even here, when you minister the gospel, the gospel, uh, minister the gospel, you will be persecuted. In other words, if you don't minister the gospel and live the gospel, you won't be persecuted. If you live the gospel, so, in effect... <laughs> We cause persecution on ourselves. And we must do that. Because we believe that we are going to heaven. We believe we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in God the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus died for us. And, and He gave us new life. And He rose from the dead. And He's going to come the second coming to judge the whole world. The sinful world. And we must preach it. It is a command from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We must preach the gospel. So if we preach the gospel and live the gospel, you will be persecuted. That's why a lot of Christians are these private secret Christians. They don't want to live what they believe in their hearts. And if you go out in this world, the entire world is exactly the same. In your workplace, in your workforce, in business, it's exactly the same. For the sinner as well as for you. And when you make a decision to obey the, 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 the word of God rather than to go after sinful ways or do uh, um, uh, business in a uh, d uh, um, wrongful way. <laughs> now I lost the word. Business in a wrongful way. Uh, um, I can I say Afrikaans word, I can hear it clear. But you decide rather to do the word of God, then you will also be persecuted because you rather accept it to um, take responsibility for your, uh, for your spiritual life than to go after the lust and the greed of the world for financial gain and maybe material gain or to be in the good books of everybody around you. And this is also a decision that we have to make in our lives. And if we don't live and speak the word of God, regardless of the consequences, our faith won't be purified, even if we don't sin according to our perception of sin. Because sometimes we just shy away. We don't really sin. We don't continue with sin. But we shy away in the way we act, in the way we do, in the way we speak. And this is why Jesus Christ says that if you're going to deny me before men, I'm going to deny you when I am going to come in the clouds of glory and you will be denied before the Father and His holy angels at the second coming. So to shy away and not live and speak the gospel is, is, is the same, is as damning as continue in willful sin every single day of your life. So even business decisions that you have to make, even decisions in your workplace, decisions in your everyday life, in your family, in your friends that you still have. We must make the right decision. And we deny the gospel in so many ways. And this is also a thing that we must sort out in our lives. Because the Bible says to us that um, a lot of people, because they don't have root in themselves, in the time of temptation, in the times of troubles, in the time of persecution, they fall away. 
They shy away from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is extremely damning. Then we think we're going to heaven because I don't, according to my interpretation of sin, I don't sin anymore. I live a good life. But do we really, really live the gospel in all the spheres in our lives? Or are we just talking the gospel? Now, when we, uh, uh, when we read in Revelation 12, verses 11, Revelation 12, verses 11, the only way to overcome, because the beast that the Bible talks about here and the dragon, the only way to overcome this world and the ruler of this world, which is Satan, is first of all by the blood of the Lamb. So first of all, you must give your life to the Lord. You must be spiritually circumcised in the heart. And then, and then by daily confessing and resisting to a sin to blood. The Bible also says in Hebrews 12 that we must resist sin uh, against blood. So we must make an effort. So this is how we uh, resist sin. The blood of the Lamb, and every day when we confess our sin, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses our soul from the sin that we have committed. So this is also one of the aspects that we need to address in our lives and act upon the Word of God so that our lives can be cleansed. Now the next thing, how to overcome this world, is the Word of our testimony. So we must act and speak uh, the word of God regardless of the consequences. And we withdraw because we know what sometimes the consequences will be and we might experience lack in the material or be uh, uh, um, uh, um, separated from our family or be ignored in family and friends or be ignored in the workplace, etc. And if we don't live and speak the gospel wherever we go, it's also useless. And this, uh, then we won't be able, uh, be able to overcome the dragon and the beast of this world. Now the other one is uh, not, living our, uh, not loving our lives unto death. Now th this is not just about the physical, but not to love this old sinful nature and reasoning by giving it up for the sake of the gospel. Because we have a way of reasoning. And we don't want to give that up for the sake of the gospel. Yes, you are born again. Maybe you confess your sin. Maybe you also do uh, minister the gospel here and there. And as you feel happy with it. But are we really denying our lives unto death. So that the life of Christ can be revealed in us, because the word of God says, Jesus Christ says, if we, if we, uh, uh, if we, uh, um, wants to gain our life in this world, we will lose it. Now, let us read here in John 12, verses 25. John 12, verses 25. John 12, verses 25. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And this is the purpose of all the trials is to keep your soul for eternal life. And we must act as the word instructs us and expects of us. That is the will of God. And when we do the will of God, we fall into various kinds of tribulations. We need to make a decision whether we're going to sin or act upon the word. We one must make a decision if persecution comes for the sake of the gospel and tribulation comes and temptation comes for the sake of the gospel. We must be able to rather do than act upon the word of God. Now Jesus Christ also says in Luke 9, in Luke 9 verses 23 till 24, Luke 9 verse 23 till 25, sorry, Luke 9 23 to 25. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And it's interesting how Jesus Christ says, If anyone desires, a lot of people desires to serve the Lord, desire to go to heaven. But he says, The only way is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. So if we desire to save our life in this world, just to live and to eat and to have a home. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it 
to a man if he gains the world and is himself destroyed or lost. Now, the purpose of trials and temptations in this world, testing, is so that the sinful desires, the wrong motives in our heart can get revealed and we can repent from that so that we can enter into eternal life. This is what this daily cross, taking up your daily cross means. Not to feel sorry about your circumstances, but to deny this old man, this old nature, this old way of thinking, this old way of reasoning. Now, I want to conclude. Why must we count it all joy? Why why, why? Let us read two very interesting verses. And I think by just reading the scriptures, you will find encouragement. Matthew 5 from verse 10 till 12. Matthew 5 from verse 10 till 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you are persecuted, that's why he says count it all joy. Then you are a heir of the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and uh, uh, rev when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Have you been accused falsely as a child of God? Many times. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Heaven, not your reward, yeah. <laughs> we must understand the reward is in heaven, and that is the saving of your soul. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Don't you rather want it to be associated by those who have been persecuted for the sake of the gospel than to have your name? placed next to people who are atheists and seek after the lust and the greediness of this world. Now the last scripture I just want to read to you. 1 Peter 4 verses 12 till 15. 1 Peter 4 verse 12 till 15. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So if there is no persecution, no trials in our day, then there is something strange happening to us. But if the fiery trials are there, there is nothing, something strange. There is no strange thing happening to you because yours is the kingdom of heaven. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering you partake of, suf of Christ's suffering. You don't have to go to a physical cross. Just by denying the world and refusing to, 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 to walk according to the things of the world, you partake of the sufferings in Christ. Isn't that, that supposed to be an honor? That's supposed to be something that we need to rejoice in instead of hanging our heads down and way down and think that there's something wrong with you. No, there's not something wrong with you. If the temptation of sin is there, if the persecution is there, then you must rejoice because you are partakers of Christ's suffering in your life. Hallelujah. That when his glory is revealed, Peter heard from Jesus. The Holy Spirit confirmed to Peter what Jesus Christ said. You may also be glad with exceedingly joy. So when Jesus Christ got, gets revealed, you will be glad with exceedingly joy. Now you might have sorrow from time to time. But there comes a day and you must look forward for the day. Not hanging your head until that day. Be joyful until that day. Hallelujah. If you are reproached for the name of Christ. Blessed are you. Happy are you. Fortunate are you. For the spirit. This is amazing. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you are persecuted for the sake of the gospel, 
God's spirit and his glory rests upon you. We want God's spirit to be manifest and to be rested upon us. We want to know it's there. The moment when you get persecuted, when you fall into various trials and temptations, the moment when you are enticed and tempted with sin, you feel guilty. What makes you feel guilty? God's Spirit reveals His Word. He makes His Word alive. The Word and the Spirit cannot be separated. Because the Spirit testifies only of the Word. And that makes the Word alive. That makes the Word like a fire. Then, hallelujah, God's Spirit is there to tell you and to guide you according to the Word of God. That is why His glory rests upon you. So if you are in that situation and you feel guilty, then you must say, Lord, thank you that your Spirit are here in my heart at this moment. That's because that is why you feel guilty. It's because God's Spirit is there. It's not because it's not there. <laughs> And on their part, he is blasphemed. And I want to encourage you with this. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. So every time somebody persecutes you, every, every time if somebody throws away your name falsely and, and accuses you falsely, then they glorify God. That's why I say, be happy. Because a sinner, in his sinful ways, are busy glorifying God. And everybody that resists, even if he says he's a Christian, if he resists the truth of the gospel, hallelujah, God get glorified, then we don't want God to be glorified. We get so heavy weighted down and our heads hanging like Cain. No, 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 no. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody, one who walks around with gossip and all that stuff, eh? In other people's matters. Praise the Lord. If we are in other people's matters, our busybody must get away from that. Because busybodies, if we continue in that and run, don't repent from that, we can also be lost. So, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is if there is, if you still feel guilty about sin, God's Spirit and His glory is there at that very moment in your life. If you get persecuted for a gospel's sake, God's Spirit is there and God gets glorified. If you can endure that and not hit back and not retaliate and say, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, for this false accusation. Praise the Lord that you are coming against uh, 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 the gospel of truth, hallelujah. Isn't, isn't a word like a fire of joy and happiness and gladness that are burning in our heart and is the desire of the word in our heart, hallelujah. And we must have that love, that fiery love of God in our heart to live, act, speak and conduct our lives according to the word so that other people can also be saved. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord as I see the comments. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let this word sink in. Go and pray. Go and ponder over it and read the scriptures. And there's so much more scriptures I can carry on the whole night just reading scriptures. How you are blessed when the trials and fiery persecutions comes your way. Praise the name of the Lord. May you have a great night's sleep. Rest well if you can sleep. Because sometimes the joy of the Lord are so great in one's heart. You even find it difficult to sleep. Hallelujah. Let's hope that's the reason why you lay awake. And not because of worries. If you worry, start to pray. And God will help you. Amen. May you have a blessed evening. Blessings from my side. Hallelujah. Love you lots. Bye. <laughs>